Hello and welcome again to Expanding the Bible. I'm your host Nathaniel Morell. In this study, I would like to discuss the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of Satan. What is the synagogue of Satan and who belongs to the synagogue of Satan? A synagogue is uh, a church, as it were. That's the Jewish terminology for saying church or meeting house, place of worship. So the Bible talks, there's two places in the Bible that talk about those that come from the synagogue of Satan. We want to look at who are those and why Why, why does the Bible call it the synagogue of Satan? What is this some uh, mysterious cult underground uh, tunnel mysterious place uh, that's plotting the downfall of mankind and the rise of the Antichrist. Is this what the Bible is talking about or is it more plain broad terms of beware of those among us that may be on the wrong path and are agents of Satan to try to get us off the right path to follow in their uh, uh, wrong path towards perdition. Let's see what the Bible says about this. Let's open up your Bibles to the book of Revelation. The book of of Revelation. Let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and the book of Revelation. This is where we are going to find the terminology of synagogue of Satan. It's only found twice in the Bible and it is here in Revelation chapter 2 and in Revelation chapter 3. We're going to look at both of them but let's look at Revelation 2 first. So let's look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9. See what it says and here is uh, uh, God giving messages through the Apostle John to to the seven churches of Asia. Now these seven churches are very interesting. One by one, God tells them of the things that they're doing that he likes, and then he reproves them as it were, and tells them the things that they are doing that he doesn't like. Now these churches, they were seven literal churches in Asia, um, but these churches could also, also have a symbolic uh, application in terms through the history of God's church, God's movement throughout Earth's history. Uh, uh, when Jesus Jesus came down and established the Christian religion through his 12 apostles all the way through the dark ages all the way through the age of enlightenment and the great awakening uh, of the United States and Europe um, all the way till today and the end of time in the future these churches have applications and they represent also segments and parts of God's church throughout history they also have an application for us today when you look at the things that God is reproving them and saying where they must work on uh, they have application to us today uh, we're not going to dwell deep into these churches but if you want to find out more specific on what these church what these churches are about you can go to EG Bible School YouTube on EG Bible School and uh, type in EG Bible School you have Pastor Darren Tinsley there he's in the middle of doing a Daniel uh, uh, Revelation, Daniel Revelation uh, uh, prophecy uh, seminar uh, sermons, and you can find uh, his uh, sermons on the seven churches uh, of Revelation. They're right there if you so desire to look into that. But right now, here we have the church of Smyrna, the church of Smyrna, and in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9, God says to them, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty but thou art rich so they are in tribulation they are in poverty but they are rich what does that mean that means just like um when jesus said uh, uh, sell what you have and give to the poor and you'll have riches in heaven. So these people were persecuted. They were kind people. They, they, they helped. They gave alms to whoever uh, needed help. They helped the needy and they were in poverty. But because of their kindness and their generosity, they were rich in heavenly riches. And it says, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So what? So here we see the synagogue of Satan, people who call themselves Jews but are not. And God here says they speak blasphemy and belong to the synagogue of Satan. So what exactly does that mean? Is God telling John to the seven churches that those who aren't Jews... Those that are Gentiles belong to the synagogue of Satan? Is that what's going on here? It can't be. It'll be a contradiction to the Bible, and we'll see why. And it'll be, it'll be absurd because most, if not all, of the seven churches in Asia were mostly people who are and were Gentiles. 
It wasn't, this is not a letter to the Jewish uh, community per se. These are letters to the church in Asia that are predominantly Gentiles who have converted from their heathen, uh, uh, pagan way of religion to the Christian religion. So what does it mean when it says that they say they are Jews but are not? What, what, what is the importance of this? Is this, is it an importance being a Jew? Is that what it's saying here? Well, let's look at, let's go jump with me to Romans. Jump with me to Romans. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Let's go to Romans chapter 2 and verse 28 through 29. Is it really important for you to be a Jew to have salvation? Because that's what the Jewish people believed. That's why they, 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 they did not like and they persecuted the apostolic Christian church because the Christian church taught that you don't need to be a Jew to receive the promises of God. You don't need to be circumcised to receive the covenant of God. All you have to do is accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and, and, and accept His grace, His blood for the forgiveness of sins, be baptized under His name, and it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek, bond or free from the seed of Abraham, or Gentiles, you are all one in Christ and grafted all into that tree. That's why the Jews, the, from the Jewish church, the chief priests and scribes, they persecuted the apostolic church. They persecuted the first Christian, uh, early Christian church because they taught to them, the Jews held to the concept that you had to be a Jew in order to receive the blessings of God. If you were a Gentile, no, God, God is not going to save you. But the Jews were supposed to be God's favorite people, God's people on earth, and they were circumcised according to the law. And, and, and anything contrary to that was considered blasphemy. So let's see if the Bible is actually saying that you need to be a Jew, you need to be circumcised, you need to be of the line of Abraham in order to obtain the promise. If not, then you belong to the synagogue of Satan. Let's see this. Let's go to Romans chapter 2 and let's read verse 28 and 29. Uh, Paul says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not of the letter who Whose praise is not of men, but of God. So Paul here says that God is asking not for circumcision in the flesh. That is not what God is asking. Now God is asking for circumcision of the heart. Christ died on the cross. Now salvation, the gospel, is open to all the world. It's not just for the Jews. It's for the Greeks and for the other Gentiles as well. The gospel does not discriminate. You don't have to be a Jew to be saved. No, you could be as you are, a Gentile who believes in Christ and converts from his pagan religion and accepts the grace and mercy of Christ. Christ wants you to be circumcised, not in the flesh, but your heart. Is your heart circumcised? Are you a Jew? Are you a Jew? Not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward, but a Jew inwardly. Are you a spiritual Jew? God is looking for those who will change their lives to become spiritual Israel. Let's go to Romans chapter 9. Stay with me in the book of Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Romans 9, verse 6 and 7 says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are of the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So here Paul, the Holy Spirit through the, the Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is saying not everyone that is in Israel are Israel. Just because you call yourself, just because you are a Jew by the seed of Abraham doesn't mean that you are Israel. Are you converted in heart? Are you become a spiritual Jew? That is what God is looking for. Just because you are of the seed of Abraham doesn't mean anything. God is saying, yes, you may be of the seed of Abraham, but are you of the seed of Isaac, the son of the promise, which is Christ. Christ was that seed, that promise that was promised to Abraham. In thy seed through all the nations of the world will be blessed through Christ from the seed of Abraham, through Isaac, the son of the promise, the whole world will be blessed. Are we of the seed of Isaac, the son of the promise through Abraham, which is Christ? Let's go to 
Let's go to Galatians. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Let's read verse 28 and 29. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 through 29. And this is what God says. It says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So if we belong to Christ, then we have automatically been accepted into Abraham's seed. There's another place in the Bible here, Paul says that he, he, he references as a tree, and, and there are many branches that are engrafted of that tree trunk. And every time a soul accepts Christ, whether they are Jews or not, they get grafted into the tree. So God is looking for spiritual Jews, those who will circumcise not their flesh but their hearts and make a covenant with God to follow Him. So let's go back to Revelation, Revelation chapter Let's go to Revelation chapter 3 now. Revelation chapter 3. So when God says that there are Jews, who there are people who say they are Jews but are not, it's not talking about the literal Jew. Because it doesn't matter if you are a literal Jew or not, everybody can accept the gospel. But those who claim they are spiritual Jews, those who claim that they have circumcised their hearts, those who claim that they follow after righteousness, but... By their fruits ye shall know them. How the way they live their lives, they still live their lives ungodly, uh, 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 ungodly lives uh, going on not according to the word of God. They still do the lust of the flesh thereof. By the way they live their lives shows that they are not spiritual Jews. Hence, they are from the synagogue of Satan. Watch this. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse verse, verse uh, 9. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. This is the church of Philadelphia. God says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. So, they lie. Those that are of the synagogue of Satan, that say they are Jews, but are not, they do lie. Who's the liar? Who is the father of all lies? Let's go to John chapter 4, chapter 8. Let's go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Let's go to John chapter 8 and verse 44. John chapter 8 and verse 44. Here Christ is speaking to the Jewish nation. He's speaking to the Jewish people. And this is what he tells them. Because of their unbelief. Because they wanted to continue to preach what was false. And not accept the truth of the gospel of Christ. God tells them, ye are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father will ye do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So who is the father of lies? Satan. So it's no, it's no surprise that if Satan is the father of all lies, that his followers are also liars. Those who claim they are true Christians... But they deny the power thereof. They have a form of godliness. But in their lives they deny the power thereof. Those are fake, phony Christians. Who end up speaking lies. Damnable heresies. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you go to, we're not going there, but if you write uh, Revelation chapter 22 verse 15, you will see that all liars, if they do not repent, will have, will be thrown into hell fire. They will not be accepted into heaven. Those, the Bible, uh, Revelation is clear, those who love, make, and believe a lie. When you make a lie, you, you believe the lie, you end up repeating the lie, you preach the lie, you end up going into false heresy and you accept one lie, you cherish that lie, it's going to make you accept another lie, and another lie, and another lie, until in the end, when the gospel, the truth of God will be preached throughout the whole world, you will not believe it. Because you love the lie that Satan, through his false ministers, his false doctrines, have been teaching... And you have accepted, so when the truth comes, you will not believe it. You will persecute it. 
because you have accepted the truth. Let's because you have accepted the lie. Let's go to Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter eleven, verse thirteen through fifteen says, "For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light." Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers be also transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So here it says that apostles, though they may appear as apostles of Christ, they could actually be apostles of the devil. And ministers who, who, who look and profess to be ministers of God could actually be ministers of the devil. Satan can mimic and counterfeit the things of God. Satan himself can transform himself as, as an angel of light. So how are we going to know the difference? How are we going to know who are the true from the counterfeit? Who's from God and who's an agent of Satan? By their fruits ye shall know them, the Bible says. How do they live their lives? What do they preach? The Bible says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Do they preach the Bible, the truth of Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, or do they just take one little verse of Scripture, or, or, or maybe half of Scripture, and make their whole theory on that half of Scripture, but then when you look at other parts of the Bible, it contradicts what they are saying. That's how the way false doctrine begins. By taking one half a truth and not combining and aligning it with other truths of the Bible. And therefore, because you reject all this and you just want to keep that, you make a whole theory based on this one little, one little verse that's taken out of context. A false doctrine could always be distinctly identified because those who study the Bible and study precept upon precept, line upon line, and the truth of God could find out this is not according to what Scripture says. Scripture never contradicts itself. Let's go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, highly prophetic chapter. Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24, Jesus says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So here Jesus says, be careful. There's going to be people who say they're Christ. They're going to draw crowds on them. Satan could transform himself as an angel of light and be as Christ himself. He's going to mimic Christ. And the whole world will believe that is Christ. But for those who study the Bible, they know the truth of God's word and they know Christ is not going to appear in that way. But for those who are oblivious to the Bible truth, they will accept this grand delusion of lie. It's a big lie that Satan has in store. He will, may, he will have his ministers do great signs and wonders. So how are we going to know what's a miracle from God and what's a miracle from Satan? Remember in Egypt, Moses and Aaron cast down the staff and the staff became a snake. It was a great sign and wonder from God to let Pharaoh know that God is God. But guess who also mimicked that same Sign and wonder. Pharaoh's magicians, satanic people used by the devil, and they also cast their staff and counterfeited the great signs and wonders. So Satan can do signs and wonders too. He can do miracles too. But how do we know which was the true and which was the counterfeit? The staff of God, the snake that the, from the staff of God swallowed up the other snakes from the staffs of the magicians. Letting the people know that Moses, the God of Moses and Aaron, Jehovah, the Lord God, is the true God. He is the Almighty Powerful. So God, in everything, God leaves clues. He leaves clues for us to go back in His Word and study His Word to see, is that the truth or is this an error? So we could know and we could uh, walk on the right path. Let's go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. 
Come with me to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. And Peter says, But there were false prophets um, also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So Peter says that in the church, in the world, there are going to be false prophets, false apostles, false ministers, agents of the devil, who, who, who appear as angels of light. They appear as spiritual Jews. They appear as converted individuals. They appear as people sent from God. But how the way what they speak, their damnable heresies, and how the way they live their lives, what they teach, their doctrine, shows that though they say they are spiritual Jews, they are not. They do lie. They come from the synagogue of Satan. They are being used by Satan whether they know it or not. They are agents of Satan preaching damnable heresies. Uh, Paul says there will be wolves in sheep's clothing that will spare not the flock. This is going to be, this has been happening throughout the history of God's church and it will continue as the end of time draws near. Paul says to Timothy that in the end times there will be people who will not hear the truth. They will forsake the truth to hear after fables and deceits. People who want to hear lies and Satan has his ministers ready dressed as ministers of Christ. So you are ready to accept it and they are going to speak damnable heresies and speak lies but using the Bible but taking it out of context and rigging the Bible. But you are going to believe it. Many people will believe it because they themselves are not grounded in Bible truth. And they will forsake the truth and accept the lie. And when, a, and when a true minister of God comes preaching the truth, they're going to persecute him. Because they've already fell in love with the lie. They have believed the lie. They don't want to forsake the lie. That they will not accept the truth. And because of that, they will be lost. That's why we have to judge all teachings by Scripture. There will be damnable heresies that will be in the church. Now, what are some of these damnable heresies? What are some of these false doctrines that come from the synagogue of Satan? There are seven, I wrote down seven points, seven uh, 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 points of doctrine that I believe are false doctrine according to the scripture. We have dealt with some of these before, um, and, and they're prominent in the Christian church. They're prominent in the Christian church, uh, and, and some are even making their way up to prominence in the Christian church in general. The first point of doctrine is the teaching that Jesus is not God. There is, there is an ideology, a concept that is teaching that Jesus is not God. They, they, they say, well, he's a divine being. He, he may have godly powers, but he's just a son of God. He is not God. They deny the concept of the Godhead, which the Bible teaches are three separate individuals in one Godhead. One God, but three individuals. It's almost like saying one family, my family, Morel. One family consists of five individuals. Mother, father, uh, myself, and two brothers. And, and these five separate individuals make up one family called Morel. It's the same thing with the Godhead. Well, when we see that in Scripture, baptizing them, God, Jesus says, baptizing them in the name, not names, if it would have been baptizing them in the names, it would have been uh, saying one person manifesting himself into three beings, which we know is not true. But in the name, meaning each individual name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three individuals. Jesus is God. Uh, uh, John says in, in John 1 uh, verse 1 uh, says, In the beginning was the Word. Who's this Word? And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So here are two individuals uh, proclaimed as God. 
Who is this word? You go down to verse 14 says, And this word became flesh and dwelled with us. And John says, We beheld his glory as the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father. This word is Christ. He is the word, the bread of life. He is the light of the world. And John says that John the Baptist testified and witnessed this true light, the word. Thomas himself called Jesus when Jesus appeared to Thomas and Thomas was doubting that Jesus resurrected. Jesus appeared before Thomas and said, Doubt me no longer, Thomas, but believe and showed him his hands and his feet. And Thomas said, My Lord and my God. Called Jesus Lord and God. Well, some people have a problem with that. They say, well, uh, uh, Paul says we have one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus. So obviously, Lord and, and, and God are separate. But Lord in the Greek means God. Many times in the Old Testament, Jesus is referred to as the Lord God. The Lord God, host of Israel, Jehovah. Here in the New Testament, Jesus again is referred to Lord and God. You go to Genesis, uh, Genesis at the creation of man, Genesis 1, uh, chapter 1, uh, and you see when God says, uh, uh, in the creation of man, it says, And the Lord said, God said, Let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. That's plural. That's more than one. God said, Let us. Us is plural. God, the word God also in both Hebrew and Greek is also written in the plural. It's not a singular word. God said, let us make man in our own image. If God was just one being, it would have said, and God said, let me make man in my own image. Singular. But that's not how the verse says. Then you go and jump to verse 1 of Genesis 1, uh, verse 2, I'm sorry, and it says, And the Spirit of God hovered over the water. So here we have the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word, Jesus, was, Jesus God, was with God the Father, and the Spirit of God also hovered among the water. There's three individual beings all in the Godhead participating in the creation of earth and mankind. I have a video uh, talking specifically on this topic uh, called Is Jesus God? I'll have that for you on the end screen also on the description below I, uh, I urge you to go to go uh, look at that so we could be grounded in the truth of God and not listen to damnable heresies and fables Paul says great is the mystery of godliness God was manifest in the flesh Jesus was manifest in the flesh, seen of angels, and, 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 and ascended back up into heavenly glory, talking about Christ. There is no doubt whatsoever in the scriptures that Jesus is God. So bad enough, we are attacking the divinity and concept and, and God, and God uh, ahead of Jesus. But the second false doctrine that is preached around is that the Holy Spirit is not a person, hence he is not also God. They teach that the Holy Spirit uh, is, is, a, is a force, a personal presence, uh, 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 some electromagnetism uh, substance, presence of force, some, some uh, 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 feeling, a uh, concept that is contrary to the Bible. If, if the Holy Spirit was just a, a force, a uh, presence, then... Why did Peter in, the, in Acts, when Ananias and Sapphira sold their land, they sold it for a certain amount of money, and they pledged uh, uh, X amount of money to the church, and they ended up keeping more and giving to the church less. They were trying to deceive God. Peter says, why have Peter, Peter asked them, did you sell it for the amount of money that you said you were going to sell it to? And they said, yes, here it is. They were lying. And Peter told them, why do you lie to the Holy Spirit. You have not lied to me. Peter says you've lied to God, calling the Holy Spirit God. But wait a minute. If the Holy Spirit is just a presence or, or, or a force, an energy field, why is it a big deal that we lie to it? A force, an energy field, a presence, that's not a living thing. It's not a living mechanism. You can lie to it. You can talk to it. You can try to talk to it. It's not going to do anything if it's just 
a, a, a wave, a, 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 a radio signal, a force, a, 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 a presence, a personal presence. It, it's not going to do anything if you talk to it. It's not going to listen to you. But if it's a person, then lying to that person is big deal. And that's why God, at the, at, 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 as soon as Peter said that, they dropped dead. They were done because they lied to God and were trying to deceive God. And God took great offense to that. If the Holy Spirit is not a person, Jesus, Jesus said, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, He will guide you into all truth. He called the Holy Spirit a He, a person, giving Him a personage. There's more to discuss about this concept. We'll, we might uh, uh, visit this concept in the future. The third point that I would like to bring out as being a heresy in the world today is the teaching doctrine of the rapture. The rapture is nowhere found in the Bible. It is a theory, and some preachers will even admit to this. They take the rapture, uh, they take it from Daniel 9, and we made a video on this. I made a video on this a couple years back. I also have it for you on the end screen and on the description below where we go specifically into the theory of the rapture. Um, it's called the rapture, seven years of tribulation, the millennium, uh, and the second coming of Christ. You would, like, uh, you would like to see that. I'll have it on the end screen and on the description. Uh, but the rapture, they take it from the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, which is a prophecy given to Daniel from the beginning of the commandment to go restore Jerusalem 490 years all the way to the Messiah, the Prince who will come and appear and then die on the cross. That is the prophecy that tells God's people, the Jews, when the Messiah was to appear. But they take the last seven years of that prophecy and throw it in the future. They cut it off and throw it in the future. It's called the gap theory of Daniel 9. It's a theory. And there's, there's nowhere, there's no place in the Bible to, to, to accept that theory. We don't see that in the scriptures. And... And very funny that in the original prophecy of Daniel 9, Christ was supposed to appear in the, in, the, in the last seven years of the prophecy, but according to the rapture, Christ doesn't appear, the Antichrist appears. So they swap Christ, they put the Antichrist in, in, in the last seven years, and they don't even run it consecutively, they chop it up and then send it to the future, when the Bible doesn't give no indication of any such thing. The Bible teaches that Jesus will come in His second coming and those, those who are His will suffer persecution. They will not be raptured into heaven before a great tribulation. No, God's people will pass through great tribulation. That's why John in Revelation is able to see the saints of God dressed in white. And he asks, who are these? And God says, these are those that pass through great tribulation. And because they have stood firmly to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, they are now in heaven. The rapture is nowhere found in the Bible. The fourth concept that is a heresy and, and widely believed in Christianity is the belief of hell and life after death. Now this is something that we just dealt with uh, uh, some weeks ago. Um, I'll put it for you on the description and on the end screen. Uh, we made a video called uh, Hell, uh, Heaven or Hell, Where Do We Go? What Happens to Us When We Die? And we found out that there is, from the Bible, there is no burning hell at this moment. When you die, you do not go to heaven, nor do you go to hell. The Bible says that when you die, the dead know not anything. The dead praise not God. Their thoughts perish. You stay in the grave waiting until Christ comes to resurrect us. And those that are dead in Christ will be resurrected and be taken up to immortality and be taken up to heaven. And those that died in, in outside of Christ that died in Satan because they believed his lies will be sadly destroyed at hellfire. They will be judged. Judgment they will, will come and they will know why they are not in heaven. It's, it's, it's a very sad thing, but people believe in this doctrine. Why? Because they do not study God's word. 
Nowhere in the Bible do we see that there is hell or people when they die going to heaven. If when we die we go to heaven, then why does Paul say that at the last trump, when Christ returns in his second coming, the dead in Christ shall rise first? But wait a minute. I thought the dead in Christ are up in heaven. So if the dead in Christ are in heaven, then why is Jesus coming? Why when Jesus at his second coming going to resurrect the dead that, are, that died in him? Makes no sense. It is not biblical. The fifth point of doctrine that is a false heresy and a damnable heresy too is the theory, the teaching of one saved, always saved. That is something prominent amongst the, Christ the Christian churches. The belief that, oh, you can just come to Christ as you are. Just accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Lift up your hands high towards heaven. You are saved. But then you can go walk out of church and live an ungodly life, but it doesn't matter. You've been saved. That was, that was the teaching of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, which we read in Revelation uh, uh, amongst the seven churches, uh, 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 Christ says this is a teaching a group of people that he hates because it's a damnable heresy. The belief that, 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 that you could live whatever lifestyle you want and still be saved in heaven. I'm sorry, that's not how the way grace works. That's not how the way God works. He doesn't work like that. So how does God work? God works by convicting you of sin. And then you fall on your knees and you confess your sins. God will be faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And just as he told the various people that he has healed, especially the woman caught in adultery, he told her, go and sin no more. You were a woman living in sin, living in adultery, but now go. God says, Christ says, I forgive you of your sins. Change your life. Do not go back to living the same way. And she changed her life around and followed Christ. That is what we ought to do. To believe that you can live your life however you please, uh, uh, not following the commandments of God and living uh, contrary to the principles of God, but still be saved. That is a deceitful lie by the devil. comes from the synagogue of Satan himself. And those who teach this are his agents are those who are Jews but are, but are not, but they do lie. And sometimes people don't know that they're preaching this heresy. That's why we must show the gospel truth to the world and preach it in love, in the love of Christ for this sin-stricken world. I, uh, I did a video on that, uh, uh, a study on that, on the once saved, always saved doctrine. I'll have that for you on the end screen and on the description below should you want to go and look into exactly what, how the Bible uh, combats that teaching. Uh, the sixth point that I, would like to, uh, that I would like to mention that is a... Uh, damnable heresy in the church is that the commandments of God were nailed to the cross and done away with. We hear all the time, oh, we are not under the law anymore. We're under grace. We're under the grace of God. We don't need to follow the law. If we live in a lawless society, just imagine the chaos that that's going to bring. We need the law of God. It's the hedge that keeps us safe in His Word. So if the law is done away with, Lend me your wife. I want to be in a relationship with her. No, no, that's committing adultery. That's going against the law of God. Oh, it's going against the law of God. But you just said the law was done away with. So I could lie now, and God is okay with it, because the law has been done away with. Thou shalt not lie. We don't need that anymore. So I can lie, and God will still accept me. No, 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 you can't be a liar. Liars will not be accepted in heaven. But you said the law is done away with. I don't need to uh, honor my father and my mother. I could kill and commit murder, and commit adultery. I could bow down myself to another God, have mercy. Because the law of God has been done away with, according to what some Christian ministers are saying. So, what is the deal here? The command, that the, well, there was two laws. There was two laws when you look at the nation of Israel. One law was the Mosaic law, the law of Moses with all the ordinances, and the other law is what James chapter 2 calls the law of liberty, the whole law, which is the Ten Commandments. One of those laws was nailed to the cross. Which one? Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, nailing it to his cross, Paul says. Which law contained, contained ordinances? 
not the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses contained ordinances, which Paul says was a law contrary to us. That law, Jesus nailed to the cross. And even Moses himself, when he finished writing the law, said this law will be a witness against thee for thy rebellion against God. So, even Moses himself said, this will be a witness against thee. Uh, uh, Paul says, this, that law was contrary to us. But God nailed it to the cross, took it out the way, and took all those ordinances out the way. So now we follow the Ten Commandments, the law of liberty. What is sin? If there's no law, then there's no sin. Sin is transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. So if there's no law, then there's no sin. And if there's no sin, we can live however we like, and we can go to heaven in sin and still committing sin and abominations because there's no law. So I could be a fornicator and a drunkard, and I could be committing unrighteous deeds, but guess what? There's no law. There's no law. I am under the grace of God. God will save me. That's another point. If there is no law, how could there be no grace? Grace is only around when there's a law. How so, you may ask? Well, let's take a, pra a more practical example. You're driving in the highway. The highway has a speed limit. That's the law of the highway. If you go beyond that speed limit, then you're breaking the law. The police stops you. And if the police stops you, it's because you are guilty of breaking that law, speed limit. You have sinned. You've transgressed and broken that law. But guess what? If the cop decides and say, you know what? I'm going to give you a warning. He just gave you grace. The policeman just gave you grace. But the policeman couldn't give you grace unless you broke a law. Which means there had to be a law around. If there was no law, if there was no speed limit, then you can drive how fast you like and you can pass the police at 200 miles an hour and he ain't going to do anything about it. Because, hey, there's no law. So there's no need to give grace because there's no law. But if, you, if there is a law and you're guilty of breaking that law, then guess what? The police can either say you're guilty of death, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal grace through Jesus Christ our Lord, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, through the grace and blood of God, that if we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. You, If you want grace, it's because there is a law. You cannot have no law but grace. Grace only works when there's a law. So the commandments of God are still with us today. In fact, the saints that will be saved in heaven, according to Revelation 14, 12, will be those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Seventh point of doctrine, last but not least, is the misconception that the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday. 99% of the Christian world worship on Sunday and keep Sunday as the day of rest. But nowhere is that found in Scripture. Nowhere do we find God changing the day. Whatever, uh, well, they say, well, we keep Sunday because Jesus resurrected on Sunday. Well, where is that a commandment in the Bible that we should now keep Sunday as a day of rest? If, if, if it's not a commandment of God, then why are we doing it? Tradition? Jesus says, in vain, do ye, uh, 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 in vain do ye forsake the commandments of God, that ye may keep your own traditions of men. For well ye reject the commandments of God, that ye may keep your own traditions. Jesus says in Mark, I believe it's Mark chapter 7. So some people say, well, we don't know what day is the seventh day. We don't know what day is the, is the seventh day Sabbath uh, of, of, of the Lord. So we just keep it on Sunday. So if you don't know what the seventh day of the week is, why do you keep Sunday? Because it's the day that Christ resurrected. What's Sunday in the Bible? Sunday is listed as the first day of the week. So we know what the first day of the week Sunday is, but we don't know what the seventh day of the week Sabbath is. In fact, when you look at the story of the resurrection of Christ in the Bible, it begins with, and when the Sabbath was passed, as it began to be the first day of the week. You'll find that in Matthew and in Luke and in John. So, when, so what's the day before 
Sunday. The Bible calls the day before Sunday the Sabbath. The day before the first day of the week is the seventh day of the week. We, have, we know that day of the week today to be Saturday, and the Bible calls that the Sabbath. Jesus in Luke 4 went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Jesus was a Jew. What days do Jews go uh, to the synagogue and worship and have their day of rest? Saturday. It's the seventh day of the week. And that is the day of rest that God at creation, He blessed it and hallowed it. He also, he also established it in His Ten Commandments. That's the reason why they teach that the commandments have been done away with because they don't want to keep the Sabbath. They see it as being legalistic. They have no problem with obeying thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lie, honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt not commit adultery. They have no problem with that. But when it comes to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, oh, we have a problem with this. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Takes you all the way back to creation. And the Lord blessed the seventh day and how it, meaning he put a special blessing on that day that you will not find in any other day of the week. And by worshiping God and resting in Christ on that day, you get to be partakers of the blessing that Christ put on that day. There is nowhere in the Bible, you can read it from cover to cover, where, where it will say that Christ changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. You ain't going to find it. The disciples never changed it. So who did? If you look at history, it was the Roman Catholic Church who changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday and did it under no pretext, no commandment in the Bible, but did it by their own church authority, and the whole world now follows that commandment of men. I talk more a little bit about that in the video, um, defending Adventism, uh, uh, um, talk about uh, right comforts, uh, why are Seventh-day Adventists wrong about the Sabbath. I'll put that for you on the description below. In it, I uh, talk about why the law of God is important and why the Sabbath is important to keep and who changed, go into the history on who changed the day of worship using history and even evangelicals, Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans, all believed at one time that the seventh day of rest was the Sabbath, Saturday, and they admit to this. But they also admit that the day was changed not by Christ or the disciples, but by the Roman Catholic Church, and they obey it. Uh, I also have a video on the, on the law of God, uh, which laws were nailed to the cross. I'll also put that on the description there below. So the Sabbath was not changed. It, was, it is still on the seventh day, Saturday. And these are just some of the doctrines, the damnable heresies that Satan has brought up. There are more. There are lots more, but we don't have time to discuss it here. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Let's go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Well, you know what? Let's jump with me to Jeremiah. Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5, uh, uh, Paul and Timothy says that in the end times there will be those who will refuse to hear the truth, but will follow after fables. Israel did just that, and they, it ended up being their destruction. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 5, Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 31, and God through Jeremiah is saying, the prophets prophesy falsely. Prophets are prophesying falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? So God is telling Israel, you love to hear lies. You're accepting the lie, accepting the truth. You have people who are of the synagogue of Satan giving you lies, and you are drinking that Kool-Aid. You, you love the lie, you've accepted the lie, you even, may I say, you vote for the lie. And then, when the truth comes... Oh, he's a conspiracy theorist, or he's, he's, a, he, he, he's a, a danger to society. But it's because we have loved the lie. We have loved the lie so much that we will accept it no matter what and reject the truth. Let's go to 2 Timothy. We close here. 2 Timothy. 
2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. That's why we have to study, the Bible says, to show thyself approved. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible is truth. God is a God of truth, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. God is not a God of lies and deception. He is a God of truth. Jump to chapter 3, verse 16, says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. Those ministers who come from the synagogue of Satan, if they are not preaching the word of truth, it is because there is no light in them. The Bible, the word of God was given to us so we could identify what is truth and what is error. And when we see the truth, we walk therein in the right path. And we get more light as God gives us light and we accept the light of God, the truth of God, and we enter into his glorious day of rest. We will be saved if we follow the truth of God. So, the synagogue of Satan, Jews who say they are, people who say they are Jews, but they are not, are those who, who, who clothe themselves as sheep. But in reality, by what they speak, by how the way they live, they are living an anti-godly life. They are, they speak deceits, and they are, whether they know it or not, are being used by Satan from his synagogue to preach damnable heresies that they will try to deceive even the very elect. That's why we must be grounded in the word of truth, in the word of God, so we could preach the truth of God, the gospel through the whole world and tell the wonderful news of the Savior, of the life of God. And then when that happens, God says the end will come, because everyone will have an opportunity to hear the truth. And it is now up to them. Do they accept the truth, or do they believe the lie of the devil? And those that believe the lie of the devil will be lost, but those who accept the truth of God will be saved. So that's what I wanted to, to look into today. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this video, please press like. Also, don't forget to subscribe. We are also on Facebook at Expounding the Bible. Until then, this is your host, Nathaniel Merle, saying, have a blessed day.